Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. This is a meeting of the Lancashire and South Cumbria Strategic Commissioning Committee. It's a formal meeting. We're joined by a number of members of the public and uh, external stakeholders for the meeting today. In normal practice, we're re recording uh, the meeting for the purpose of, of transcription and the minute writing. If I could uh, say to the members of the public and stakeholders, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for your interest in our work. Thank you for coming along today. If I could ask you to help me in managing this meeting on Teams to keep your microphone and cameras turned off and to recognise that the uh, text uh, facility in the Teams meeting is, is part of the meeting and therefore is just for members of the of the committee to use. Uh, there are a number of people who are unable to come to the meeting today and have apologised. Uh, accountable officers Andrew Bennett and Dennis Gitsey. Helen Curtis is here and will cover matters on behalf of Dennis. Uh, Helen will also cover, you're going to be busy Helen, will also cover uh, Lindsay Dickinson who's unable to attend. Further apologies from Nicola Adamson and Andrew Bibby is here. Paul Kingan, Andy Curran, as there as members of the committee, uh, of people who are usually with us and unable to be so today, Catherine Lord and Caroline Marshall will be here. We'll see Caroline when we get on to the quality and performance report. And Brent uh, isn't well, so Paul Tilsley will present items mm -hmm. 11 and 12 for us today. not been made aware of any new declarations of interest relating, relating to the items on the agenda. But when we get into any of the discussions, as always, please, if you feel that there's a, an interest that you hold, um, just make, make us aware of it at the time. And that will be absolutely fine. We've got the minutes of, the, of our last formal meeting, which was on the 10th of March. Are there any questions on the minutes or points anyone wishes to make? Can I propose that we adopt the minutes from the last meeting, please? I'll formally second those, Chairman. Yep. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Kevin, I, I think this, uh, Kevin Lavery, I think this might be your first uh, formal meeting of the Strategic Commissioning uh, Committee. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce Kevin. He's been here a number of weeks. He's the uh, designate chief executive of the Integrated Care Board. As you all know, now the legislation has received royal assent and the Integrated Care Board will come into being as the statutory body on the, the 1st of, of July. We'll talk in our agenda today about the CCG close down and the transition from CCGs to the ICB. All of that means that we will have one final meeting of this uh, committee as currently constituted uh, that will take place in June. But uh, delighted that Kevin's here and invite you, Kevin, to make any introductory uh, comments or messages that you wish to share with the committee, please. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, everyone. I thought I would, well, just first of all, start. Uh, to thank everyone for the warm welcome I've had in Lancashire and South Cumbria. I've been here for two months now, spent a lot of time out of the office getting out and about. I've been to all of the trusts and all of the councils and uh, have met a lot of CCG staff uh, during those uh, weeks and months. Been really impressed with the quality of the people. And despite all the talk of a tired workforce, I I've encountered lots of people who are high energy and really positive. So. Um, I thought I would just cover three things, David, that are topical and relevant to uh, today's agenda. Um, the setup of the new organisation, to say a few words on that, uh, the budget uh, position and uh, place-based partnership. We're doing a review of that. Just say a few words just so that people have, have, have got a, uh, an understanding of where we are on each of those. In terms of setting up the new organisation, I know that 1st of July is not that far away now. Um, we've appointed four 
uh, new executives on our designate team. Uh, so that's the medical director, the people director, the nursing director, and um, and I'm for, uh, and the CFO, the chief finance officer. Two of those individuals are in post now, and the other two join us on the first of June. So that's only a few weeks away. We've identified two further posts which are about to go to advertisement and recruitment. Uh, that's a chief digital officer. That's something I think we need to uh, give a bit of attention to going forward, and the chief performance planning and strategy um, officer as well. We're working through third tier structures now. We'll be in a position to announce them to staff very shortly, and we will go through a sort of ring fence process first with senior staff who are at risk um, uh, to uh, look at those roles. We reserve the right if we don't find suitable candidates to go out uh, uh, wider but we do expect to fill a lot of those roles internally in the process. That will all happen in June, so it's not far away at all. So that's set up uh, on budget. Uh, it's pretty challenging. Uh, we're looking at a standstill budget for the organization with, and there's still discussions centrally about provision for inflation and COVID pressures. So that's still gotta be worked through. It's, it's, it's almost done. I think it'll be signed off in, in June time, so a few weeks away. Um, the reality is that makes it pretty high risk for us uh, in terms of delivering that. So the sooner we can get it signed off and focused on delivery of those numbers, uh, the better. I guess the obvious thing is what are we doing at system level to help reduce the risk? I think there are a number of things. The first thing is working with the provider collaborative is identifying a number of major projects that will help us deliver recurring savings over a three to five year period. It's really important that we do that. So that covers areas like agency staffing, moving towards a common platform instead of each trust doing their own thing and streamlining clinical specialties. And then with those projects, having <clears throat> proper project structures in place with dedicated teams of staff, so they're just focused on those areas. It's not one of 10 things they have to do uh, and proper discipline around that process. And for future years, uh, it would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, not just to have an annual budget, but to have a budget that looks at the three to five year horizon uh, and that we sign off well before the start of the financial year so that we've got the whole 12 months uh, to deliver again. So that's where we are on budget. And then finally on place-based partnerships, uh, most of you will be aware that I've asked Jane Scattergood to lead a review of the place-based partnerships. Do we have the right number and boundaries? It's ostensibly about boundaries, but really it's about purpose and ambition. The new ICB is gonna need to be serious about rebalancing our health and care system so that we have a strong acute sector working in perfect harmony matched by an equally strong community health and care sector also working in perfect harmony. And on the community side of our system, we need to have real ambition to be a standout performer nationally and at the heart of that has to be deep integration of health and care and getting much more of a handle on the determinants of health, most of which lie outside the NHS. With that in mind, all, re all roads lead to a very close partnership with local government. And I'm concerned that the core terminosity makes that integration <clears throat> more challenging, uh, not harder rather than easier. Lancashire County Council, for example, at the moment has is involved in five place-based partnerships. No other ICB in the north of England has place-based partnerships without coterminous boundaries. So that's why we're looking at the boundaries, but it's not really about the boundaries. It's about integration. That's, that's the real prize here. And by the way, the local authorities are enthusiastically supporting that review. It's definitely not a, a done deal. It's a review, it will be rapid, um, and it's better to do it now whilst we have interim teams and governance and before we make permanent appointments. That's why we're 
really proceeding swiftly on this. Um, so um, I've probably said enough, David. In summary, um, we're making progress on the structures on the ICB for the new arrangements. Uh, the budget is going to be challenging and we need to be really focused on delivery. We are looking at the place-based boundary, uh, boundaries, but it's really about uh, the big prize here is better integration with local government going forward. I'm very happy, uh, David, to answer any questions if people have them. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> it's all very, very clear. Any questions, comments to Kevin, please? OK, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> no doubt lots of the issues that you've raised will, will, will play through a number of the discussions that we will have in this committee today. The first of which is about an update on the close down of the CCGs. Uh, Helen, you're going to lead us into this in Dennis's absence. Colleagues like me will have read the, the papers on this with some very, very detailed uh, issues in here. It's important that we don't gloss over uh, the key issues. We had a, a originally, of course, expected that the the new world would start on the 1st of April and that we'd now be uh, six weeks into it rather than six weeks out from it. And I uh, inevitably the sort of delay adds to the to the jeopardy, the risks involved in us in keeping everything in the in the right place um, and concluding all of the important statutory tasks. Uh, associated with the with the vital work of the CCGs. So, Helen, do you want to lead us into this discussion, or Roy, do you want to say anything by way of context setting and introduction first, please? Thank you, David. Um, first of all, very comprehensive report, as you've alluded to in your in your opening comments. Um, you know, I said this at the last um, Strategic Commissioning Committee, which was an informal meeting that. The amount of work shouldn't be underestimated here. Uh, it's really incredible, I think, that the people who've been involved in this have, have been able to um, supply us with the amount of information that, that we are getting. Uh, and I can't, as I say, I can't under under um, state perhaps the amount of work that's gone on. So obviously I appreciate that and I would like that fed back to the people who've been involved, not just the people who've, who've come to these meetings and um, presented, but also the people in the background who, who've done a huge amount of work within the CCG. So thank you to everyone and all the CCGs for all that due diligence that you've carried out, all that uh, sender work that you've done and receiver work. Uh, it's really appreciated. I'd, I'd perhaps come back later, David, when uh, when Helen has, uh, has presented the paper uh, with some more comments about governance arrangements post 1st of July, if that's all right with yourself. Over to you, Helen. Thanks, Roy. Thank you, Chair. Um, you'll be pleased to know the number of appendices are actually reducing now. I know that we, we probably hit a record about two meetings ago with about eight of them, uh, but I think that was important at the time to give you the level of detail uh, behind this particular programme. Um, what I want to do today is just highlight a couple of uh, elements within the paper. Um, on page 14 of your pack, you will note um, just under Ray, we are expecting nationally there to be a template made available to CCGs for accountable officers to complete, confirming the arrangements for the due diligence. We haven't had that yet. We are um, chasing that. I know that um, Jane Cass is on the call and, and she may be able to give us an update, but if not, don't worry, we're, we're making sure that we um, hunt that one down. And that's really helpful because in, instead of everybody having to make that up for themselves, we've got that nationally prescribed template to complete. And I understand the same will be applied to the readiness to operate statement for the new integrated care board. Um, what I would just like to do is to flick up on screen, if I may, the um the um if it will come up for me it might not do um uh, no it's not going to so i'll talk you through it you've got actually with your papers the overarching program plan and what the program plan uh, has now is a front covering sheet 
um, where we detail within that where we are against the items of due diligence that we've got to complete. So just by way of a refresher from last time's meeting, um, we have 90 lines within the due diligence and that ranges through the establishment of the programme itself and then into uh, corporate responsibilities, into quality governance, uh, estates, uh, HR requirements and so on. And there are 90 lines. Uh, trust me, I've counted them. Um, what we did as a piece of work uh, about two months ago was to take all those areas of due diligence and test ourselves as both uh, senders, that's the CCG, and receivers, which is the new organisation, the ICS. And the question we asked at that point was, have we completed that due diligence requirement? Now, you will recall that even though there had been a delay to the legislation, what we wanted to do was complete the due diligence wherever we could before the end of March. So that that was because what we want to do is really important that we didn't stop ourselves from the, the, the path that we were already on. So our task was complete the due diligence wherever you can. Um, and so we developed basically a system where we rated ourselves and I know it's a, a rag rating, which isn't ideal in this. So as I said to the committee last time, red is not bad in this case. Um, we have 90 items of due diligence, 30 of them have now gone green. What that means is that we completed the due diligence at the end of March and we have actually moved that to a new operating model. So in quarter one, we've stopped effectively doing that several times in the individual CCGs and we've moved to doing that once across the system. And that primarily um, applies to the areas of estates, uh, information, governance, digital and so on. So they've already moved to a new way of working, which is great because it means we do it once on behalf of us all already. There are 22 which are amber and what amber means is that we've completed the due diligence um, but there isn't a new operating model available. And what we have accepted in reality is that that new operating model will now not be in place until the 1st of July when the new um, ICB is established itself. So obviously there's lots of work underway at the present time to ensure that we're ready for the 1st of July. There are 38 elements that are flagging red. Again, I reiterate red isn't bad in this case. What it means is that you could not complete the due diligence. So for finance and for HR, you cannot complete the due diligence in advance of, for example, financial closure of the of a financial year. We know that our finance colleagues are having to close down the accounts for 21-22, and then they are having to open a new set of accounts for the first quarter of 22-23. And so in practice, you can't do your due diligence until the auditors have signed those accounts off. And there is a bit of a query about when that will be able to be done for quarter one. There's another area of um, the due diligence programme that we have kept as read, and that is quality governance. All of the due diligence has been done, but we've added an extra layer of assurance in for quality. Um, because we need to ensure that quality and transition is really kept safe. And so all of the CCGs have completed the due diligence, but we are taking that into our local quality and performance committees in each CCG for our lay members to have a, a final look at that before it's signed off and handed over to the successor committee. We felt it was really important that we did that. Um, so all of the elements of quality governance will go amber as soon as it's been by those local quality committees. And we're doing that in the same way across all of the CCGs. So we're well on our way with the closed down um, due diligence. If I could then go back to the uh, main report. Um, what, I, what I've included in this section, in this particular report, is a section at section four on communications and engagement. The due diligence guidance nationally doesn't cover everything that CCGs do. And one of the areas that we felt there was a bit of a gap was around comms and engagement. There's only one line which actually relates to um, open consultations, and that's actually gone green uh, based on the RAG rating I talked to you about before, because open consultations would now be managed by the new operating model, i.e. The, the comms and engagement um, system that we have 
already working across the ICS and into the ICB. So I asked Neil, and I know that Neil is on the call, uh, to provide us with some extra assurance into the transition board and into the strategic commissioning committee so that you can see that we are doing the work that we need to do to successfully close down our CCGs, make sure that all our websites have been appropriately managed and that we've set that up for the new system. And Neil very helpfully has provided some detail around the work that we're undertaking there. The last thing I just wanted to um, highlight, well, no, one thing before that, we remain uh, with one risk on our risk register and that relates to workforce. You'll recall from the last meeting, we amended the work wording of that slightly, but that risk does remain to us. And then I'd just like to go back um, to item two, three, and Roy, you uh, briefly mentioned this. At the last meeting of the transition board, um, we, we acknowledge that as part of this programme, we had established governance arrangements that the closed down programme could report into. And that has been to the transition board and then into the strategic commissioning committee. Now, I'm stating the obvious, the transition board and the strategic commissioning committee will cease at the end of um, June. So one of the things we need to consider is the governance arrangements for the final completion of the due diligence and also for any legacy matters for uh, CCGs. I have already flagged this to Sam Profit uh, because obviously within her portfolio as Chief Finance Officer she has corporate governance. Um, so, so we just need to be clear about what those reporting relations um, re relationships will be for closed down post 1st of July. Um, linked with that, as a closed down group, what we have also started to do is identify uh, a list of other things that we need to make sure we have in, in place for the 1st of July. Now, this is not us telling us, telling the incoming um, ICB executives what to do, it's us trying to be helpful. So to say, actually, as we're going through close down, we've thought of this, what are we going to do about it? So some examples in advance would be um, primary care commissioning committees with their delegated responsibilities. How are we going to ensure that we successfully manage any legacy issues from our primary care commissioning committees um, and hand over uh, particular elements of, of that to the successor organisation. Um, we've got some particular staffing issues that we want to make sure that in transition we don't end up with some uh, staffing risks not so much relating to uh, running costs, i.e. the management costs of running the new organisation, but where we have um, staff who are in patient facing roles within CCG. So as we want run, move from a model which might be CCG based into a model with a new staffing structure that's ICB based, we need to ensure that there aren't any vacancy gaps that give us particular problems. And again, with regard to that one, I personally flagged that to uh, Sarah O'Brien because the, the one I have in mind relates to learning disability staff. So what we're going to do is log any of those issues as we think of them. Um, Carl has kindly agreed to take that list and then hand that into, I think it's the I think it's the DAG, I get lost with the different groups, I'm afraid, but uh, the design group effectively for the ICB. And as we add to that list, we'll keep making sure that it's flagged to the appropriate um, ICB um, executive director so that we don't lose anything. As I say, it's designed to be helpful so that we make sure that we don't miss anything come the 1st of July in, in terms of identifying those uh, priorities for how do we operate when we actually hand over from one to the other. Um, David, I think that's as much as I want to say in terms of um, highlighting any specifics in the report. But as ever, I look, I can see that Carl wants to come in. It may be that Neil wants to on the comms piece. But other than that, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, great work. I'll bring Carl in, then I'll go around and ask. We've, I think we've six of the chairs in the meeting. I'd just like to go go around you all briefly just to get a, a personal perspective from within your governing bodies about how this feels and where we're at at the moment and any particular concerns that you may have. Uh, Carl first, please. Thanks, David. So, so building upon what um, Helen said, uh, just in a couple of areas to provide a bit more sort of detail and assurance. So um, as Kevin said in his introduction, you know, 
there's there's work on being undertaken to um, set out the, the sort of next layer of the um, sort of structure for the uh, for the ICB. And in advance of that, each of the ICB executives has been given a, a portfolio of responsibilities within which sit um, a lot of the um, sort of CCG um, sort of functions that that are sort of captured within the due diligence um, sort of checklist. So. Um, Part of the sort of next stage is for each of those um, ICB um, exec leads to um, sort of consider the future operating model for each of those functions sort of going forward. And it was just to ensure that, that given those, given that staffing risk that Helen had identified, then as part of that process, we would anticipate that where there are opportunities to shift some of those amber areas. Um, to a, a system operating model earlier than the 1st of July and um, to, to reduce that that risk around the sort of staffing, then of course we'll we'll ensure that we can and we, we can do that and, and along the lines of the work that we've done around sort of communications in the states um, and, uh, and um, that those other areas that we, we can sort of shift to that sort of system system operating model earlier. Um, the second point was, uh, as Helen was saying, so, so so we're building up that list of sort of questions about sort of that future design, and, and I've sort of given a commitment to take those into those um, design and establishment um, agreement sort of conversations, and I'm happy to sort of report back on uh, sort of those uh, th those areas. Adam. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Carl. Right, <clears throat> so let me um, go around the chairs as I describe, and then. Uh, we'll open up for others after that. We'll start with you, Jeff, please. So how this feels from your chair seat in the Bay and any particular issues of concern you have that we think we're not paying enough attention to? Thanks, Chair. Um, as, I've, as I've said in, in previous places um, this week, I, I, I don't live and breathe this like others do, so I'm not feeling the pain. So I'm, I'm very grateful for everybody at the system or CCG level for all the work they're doing. Uh, and so my question, my, my concern and my question might be seem a bit simple, but in previous transitions, um, similar transitions, there's always been legacy work. I think Helen used the word legacy. And, and, and I think you said something about the finances not being able to be signed off till audit had been done, and that, that. So that. So the question is about what happens after the first of July, and it's been raised by some of my governing body members, particularly lay members. So that it's clear now that we come to an end on the thirtieth of June, and that's the end. That's the end of life for governing bodies and lay members, or is it? So my question is, how do we deal with those issues that are legacy? Is there any requirement? for current CCG governing body members to be available to transact any business, be, uh, you know, because the legislation demands it, or can the new organisation just take over everything and they are completely relieved of their duties? That's the, that's the, the, that's the, um, the question from Morecambe Bay. Uh, thank you, Jeff. We'll, we'll collect these uh, questions up and uh, come back to them. Uh, Peter, if you're there. Peter Gregory, please. Hi, hi, Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, a bit like Jeff, really. For, for me personally, it, it's been relatively painless, although I know I'm very conscious of the, the hard work that goes on behind the scenes, behind the governing body for this. Um, I, the, the actual close down and, and transition from a governance perspective, I, I think, I think has, um, for, for, for my teams, has gone smoothly. I, I think that concerns around that are probably overshadowed by, by concerns regarding staffing arrangements and where people people jobs are going to be in, in at the end of July and that that probably remains uh, and, and presents itself more 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 than, than concerns regarding the governance um but uh, for, from in terms of the, the work that Dennis and Helen have done I think I think it's gone very smoothly thank you Peter uh, Adam please <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just uh, like Jeff and Peter. I haven't sort of been uh, in the in the thick of it. We've been really lucky. We have had Jane Higgs, uh, who's been helping with the uh, CCG close down, who's uh, immensely experienced. So uh, she's taken a big, big burden off uh, myself uh, in particular. But uh, Roy obviously has uh, loads of experience as well. So he's been quite intimately involved with the things that perhaps me as the clinical chair. 
uh, wouldn't. Uh, so they've both been uh, immense sources of, of help. Um, I would just echo uh, what Jeff uh, has asked about sort of whether everything just seizes them or whether we still need sort of a little bit of an overlap of people signing things off after the, um, uh, the, the 30th of June. Um, but other than that, I have nothing else to comment on. Thank you, Adam. Samantha, please. Thank you, David. I mean, from, from Central, um, there's been an immense recognition and uh, gratitude towards the work that uh, Helen and Dennis have done in, in terms of the transition. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a massive piece of work. Um, and obviously because um, Helen and Dennis are in, in our team, so we, we get to hear of it probably more, more often than, than sort of anyone else. Um, uh, no major concerns apart from, I suppose, the main thing is about what's going to happen to staff, where are they going to go, uh, where, where are they going to be placed, uh, those sort of concerns. And there was one other concern that was raised in the last last meeting, which, which, which was about quality. And Helen assured them that it's been looked at on a, on a much wider f footprint as well. So, um, so that that was, I think, well well received. Um, but apart from that, I mean, the Debbie is here, so she 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 she, she probably would be able to uh, add add to 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 do this. Thank you, Samantha and Thank Richard, you. please. Yes, thank you, Dave. Is um, firstly, I think that there's great appreciation from um, from governing body in terms of the work Helen and Dennis are doing. There's no doubt, and um, and and I guess in terms of the risk register, you know, the the, the one main one on there is is about staffing, uh, and that's something that we 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 talked about a lot in governing body. I have to say, I, I think I feel their pain a little bit. If if I'm honest, I've got you know when you start to talk about talk to colleagues about their working days. These are people under pressure, working very long days, sending emails, you know, late into the evening, coming and going from meetings, leaving, rejoining. They're just stretched people who are, who are trying to do multiple things all at the same time. And they go about it with very calm professionalism, really, I suppose is, is, is how I've described it. Um, but these people who are under pressure are often uncertain about their own futures. So they have a huge amount of um, gratitude for myself and, and from governing body. But they're doing a great job, uh, and and there's there's nothing else I can ask of them, and they've just got my support, and we we, we try and help move through to the uh, to the end of June. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, Richard. And Roy, back to you. Now I don't know if, if you can give us some more thoughts on this post 30th of June. I mean, my assumption is it just transfers to the new to the successor body, all of this, and that people will move on. Um, to you, Roy. Thanks, David. I think, I think Sam's on the meetings might be able to comment on the uh, the financial position uh, after the first um, after the first of July. But uh, I did express some concerns in the in the transition board about what those arrangements might be after the the end date of the thirtieth of June, and a number of colleagues in today's meeting have, have expressed similar issues that I was thinking about. Helen helpfully uh, alluded to some of the issues that were are in. Um, Section two, I think, of the paper that's uh, that's um, we've we've received today. So, my, my concern, I think, I say that was raised at at um, <clears throat> excuse me at uh, the the transition board meeting it was about two things, and both of those have been commented on. One was about the financial uh, responsibilities, uh, and I suppose audit chair's responsibilities after the first of July, because ultimately they have those responsibilities in terms of closing the account down and signing off final um, final accounts. So I guess there's a responsibility there that Sam might be able to uh, comment on for us. But I think you're right, David. Uh, things do um, transition over to the ICB board and those responsibilities do. Uh, however, I would just comment again on the um, clinical, uh, sorry, on the um, primary care commissioning committees uh, and at the transition board, um, I did ask a question about, about how those would be 
um, how that um, work that is is now been uh, that the primary care commissioning committees are involved in certainly at um, practice level and within primary care and community care a significant amount of work is being dealt with I think we all know that that work in terms of delegation cannot be double delegated uh, we were delegated that uh, responsibility from NHS and I some some time ago and I think the majority of primary care commissioning committees took on full responsibility for those delegation arrangements. So I think it's really important that we understand how those delegation arrangements uh, can be dealt with post 1st of July. So I did ask the Peter Tinson, I know Peter's on the meeting again this afternoon as well, and Peter perhaps can come back on this. And I know he's, I see he's just put his hand up, but I, I did ask um, Andrew to, to write to Peter uh, which he, Pete, uh, Andrew helpfully did to to ask about the future um, governance arrangements of the decisions and matters in primary care, which clearly are currently within the scope of our of, our, of those committees. So uh, I do recognise there's a primary care subcell and there is a primary care program board, uh, and they are discussing discussing those future arrangements. And I think that will be coming back to the ICB um, via possibly Andrew and to yourself, David and, and Kevin. Um, I was wondering actually, and I did ask the question about um, whether there might be something at locality level, um, whether we might have a um, transformation sort of group or take on some sort of responsibilities at locality level not a committee I'm, I'm 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 specifically saying but some sort of group within the primary uh, within the place-based partnership um so i don't think we could understand what the authority of that might be uh, at the present time because i know that's gone that's not been i'm not sure if that's been discussed within the two um the primary care cell and the and the program board that i just referenced earlier um so I think there's some issues there that are probably outstanding, not not um, irre irreconcilable, I'm sure. Uh, and Peter, I say, he's going to come back to us. Uh, I did ask Andrew if Peter could do a short explanatory note for myself and the other primary care chairs uh, at CCG level, which which Peter has has uh, said he will do. So that note will go out hopefully to all primary care commissioning chairs explaining the current position and what the future arrangements may be after that particular date. So I think I'll just stop there, David, if that's OK with yourself. Um, other than to say as well, I, I should mention as well the staffing issue and also that I recognise the comments that are coming back from chairs. Uh, OK, about staffs with its uh, staff within each of their organisations, so I recognise that as well. OK, thank you, Roy. I've got a number to come in. Uh, Debbie, you've been very patient for those. Please come in. Thanks, David. Um, I just wanted to sort of ask a question really with Malay, Malay hat on and my sort of um, plain English approach, if that's OK, which Helen's very used to. So I'm really interested in more assurance around that staffing risk, which has sort of come through in, in comments and sort of discussions today, because obviously it's been 16 for a while. And whilst it's positive that it's not going to um, up, it's also not going down, which makes me worry really whether we've actually got all of the levers and everything as aligned as we could do. So I'm sort of interested in that from sort of a statutory perspective, a strategic perspective about making sure that we've got the right people in the right place as far as we can do, but also from a welfare perspective as well. And I think that's something that Richard sort of picked up about how this actually feels if people aren't yeah, clear yeah. where they're going to be. So I think sort of my, my question really is, do we expect doing what we're planning to do between now and the new organisation being introduced that it will go down or do we expect it just to stay at 16? And if it stays at 16, uh, what does that feel like? So what, what are we missing? Um, are there any other opportunities for us to do or decide things differently between now and the end of June that would mean we'd have more assurance around people being both in the right place for them, but also the right place for the organisations as well? Thanks, Debbie. Uh, Helen, I'll come back to you <clears throat> in a moment. I'll take Peter first. Peter, you are the master of the short explanatory note. Is there anything that uh, that you want to say about the one that you've just written or? 
just, uh, otherwise. Just, just to re Thanks, David. And just to respond to, to Roy's uh, comments, and Roy, you appear very well briefed, is the first thing to say. Uh, That's is, 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 is that we, we have been working with PLACE and NHSEI colleagues over a number of weeks to develop uh, two final draft TORs, uh, one for a, a primary care and integrated neighbourhood care transformation group at system level, uh, and the second one, a primary care contracting committee or subcommittee. Uh, and those TORs were endorsed by the Primary Care Programme Board uh, earlier on this week, uh, but clearly subject to discussion with ICS executive colleagues who I'm aware were discussing uh, governance arrangements earlier on this week. Uh, so the final draft of those TORs, I have a conversation with uh, David Levy about tomorrow morning uh, as the identified ICS exec lead uh, for primary care. Uh, and then what I'm hoping to do, Roy, is and I've committed to do is before the end of next week, uh, communicate uh, the the uh, proposals uh, to primary care commissioning committees uh, and, and other colleagues, uh, recognising that that primary care contracting subcommittee also includes community pharmacy uh, as well. Thank you, Peter. Right, Helen, so there's still a number of loose ends from the conversation. Can I ask you to sweep them up now, please, before I move on? I'll certainly try. Um, so in relation to um, year end and, and the financial uh, elements, um, Kirsty Hollis leads on closed down for us across all of the CCGs. And at the exec meeting last week, um, she talked about um, the requirement for our audit committees internally within each of the CCGs to have met uh, before the end of the year. Uh, that would then go into our governing bodies. So there is that uh, question around where those minutes ultimately go to. But for audit committee chairs to have signed off the um, audit of accounts for this particular financial year and that they would go into the newly established ICB audit committee. There is a question about the uh, quarter one accounts because um, the external auditors who would normally audit those accounts go straight from NHS accounts into local authority ones. So there is a bit of a time delay uh, on that. But again, the new audit committee would be established. So the short answer to Jeff's question is no, there's not a requirement for governing body members to continue to work after the end of, of June. So that's the short answer, I'm afraid. Um, the, in relation to um, the workforce risk, uh, you're absolutely right to continue to identify it, Debbie. I know certainly in Pennine Langs there is a specific pocket because of three retirements that are all impacting on the finance department. So what we're finding is that there are certain pockets where this is a particular problem. Um, what we are all doing is try to work to support each other. So where there are gaps, we are trying to cross support. So there's a corporate governance gap in West Lank. So we're doing what we can to enable everybody to cross the line successfully. I, I think for me, um, if I were to give an honest answer, I would say I don't think that risk will come down significantly before the end of June. I think the key thing to it is enabling people to understand what their future position um, will be. We're doing lots of work around um, resilience. We're doing lots of work around um, welfare and support to our staff, but there's no substitute for actually giving them certainty around future roles and them just understanding um, what they will be doing moving forwards. To that end, I think the fact that we've now got the execs in place at the ICB, we know where their portfolios are, enables to have that sort of speed up, if you like, of the discussions around those structures. And I think that is what is really going to help um, our staff as we move forward. Um, I think those were the loose ends, but we have certainly put most of those um, chair onto the list that I referred to before that we're identifying as things that we need to make sure that we get sorted. OK, thank you very much, Helen. <clears throat> thank you to you and colleagues for this ongoing work. It's only, only six or seven more weeks to go on this. We look forward to keep going and um, <clears throat> we look forward to receiving uh, uh, your report at the at the June meeting. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, right, ICB Constitution, uh, Deborah and Victoria, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I'll take the report as read, and if I can just focus on the ICB constitution, and then I'll hand over to Victoria. 
uh, for part B of the report around the partner members. So it's to really just update and inform the committee of the ongoing development of the RCB constitution and then the final key steps that we need to meet before establishment of the ICB. So the settled constitution was submitted on the 22nd of April um, and then the next steps will be for a final submission on the 20th of May. Prior to that, um, NHSE have updated a, a, the model constitution on the 31st of March. So section two just highlights what those key updates were. And if I can just draw out um, one of them, which was around board membership. So there's now a requirement from NHS England that one of the board members um, is a specialist around mental health provision. And that needs to be at an executive level. There, there were three options as to how that position may be filled, but because of our um, board composition and that we will have two partner members, one of them that will need to meet those requirements, there's no additional um, post within our within our board that will that will undertake that additional role. And then the other the other section uh, that was quite detailed that had gone into that model constitution was around um, model wording has been provided to describe the process around um, the selection, nomination and appointment of our partner members, which we'll go into in more detail um, in part B of this report. So the settled constitution was submitted on the 22nd of April and by settled, that was an expectation that that constitution uh, submission would be as final as possible. Um, we've, we've got feedback from region um, which has been very minor. We've now received that feedback. Uh, there were a couple of minor amendments that did go into that submission. They were local amendments, which are highlighted under section three of this report. Um, and there's still a couple of sections to be finalised, which are the main one being again around the partner members, um, and because we have to include within the constitution. Uh, the, par the partner members or the nominating organisations for partner members for FTs and trusts and local authorities. Primary medical care partner members that are eligible to nominate will be held within the governance handbook. So next steps, which was around the feedback from, from that submission, which we've had, as I've just touched on, uh, that was very positive. Um, some, some minor amendments that we need to undertake. Um, we are expecting further guidance to be published tomorrow on the 13th of May, which will be um, on the preparation of RCB constitutions. I don't think we're expecting anything additional within that that we're not aware of. And then alongside that, they'll also publish the final model constitution template. And we need to then submit back to region on the 20th of May. And then the regional director uh, will sign that off on the 27th of May. Uh, that will then come to this committee on the 9th of June uh, to be ratified, uh, but it will be published, or the expectation is that all constitutions will be published on the NHSC website on the 1st of June. So do you want me to pause for any questions around that section, David, or go into the uh, partner member process? Carry on, please, Deb. Vicky? Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. Thanks, David. Um, the second part of the paper um, provides an update on the process regarding our partner members, where we are to date and the next steps. Um, you'll recall that Lancashire and South Cumbria has previously agreed that the ICB unitary board will have four partner members, one from local authority, one from primary medical services and two from NHS trusts and foundation trusts. Um, of those two, as Deborah said, one brings the perspective, knowledge and experience of the provision of mental health services and one around the perspective, knowledge and experience around acute and community services. We do need to consider those two together to make sure that the full breadth of services are appropriately um, covered there. Uh, on page 42 of your pack, uh, the process for joint nomination, selection and appointment uh, is set out as described nationally uh, in the regulations, along with the criteria to determine which organisations are eligible to nominate. We've set those out in, in the paper there. The paper also sets out across page 43 and 44 
how we've applied the criteria uh, in order to determine what that list of organisations looks like. Um, from a local authority perspective, it's the four unitary or upper tier local authorities within the Lancashire and South Cumbria footprint. For primary medical care services, as Deborah said, we have 201 practices identified that meet the criteria there. And for trusts and foundation trusts, we do have some ongoing dialogue with trusts who provide services into our population, but actually sit outside the borders of the Lancashire and South Cumbria ICB. Those conversations are mainly concluded now, uh, so we should be able to confirm that final list of trusts today. It's just worth noting that there is also an expectation uh, that every ICB has an ambulance trust as one of its partners and therefore they will automatically become one of our um, eligible foundation trusts or trusts that can nominate into those partner member roles. The timeline for our process in Lancashire and South Cumbria, so essentially how we're applying the national regulations and the ask of us around this process is outlined on page 45 of your pack. We have commenced that process this week. Uh, and issued nomination packs, which include a role description for each of those partner members we've referenced, guidance around the process, noting that for those that are not very close to this, like Deb and I, it is quite complex. So we have tried to set that out fairly simply in some accompanying guidance and then a, a nomination form for use by each of the, the organisations and an individual expression of interest form which asks for some uh, statements from the, the individuals who are actually nominated. Uh, we anticipate that following this process, we should be able to confirm appointments week commencing uh, the 13th of June. Thank you, David. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you. We'll take now any questions of clarification that are best dealt with in the meeting rather than outside. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a, a very, very detailed process that Deborah and Victoria manage well. Any students of 13th century British history in this meeting will appreciate that the Magna Carta was significantly more straightforward than the ICB constitution. Any any questions that anyone wishes to raise? OK, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Well Dave. done, Deborah. Well done, Vicky. Thank you. Let's get on to talk about the strategies for working with people and communities, Neil. Uh, thanks, Chair. So, so the report with the paper introduces the work in Langston, South Cumbria to develop our ambitions around our working with people and communities for the ICB. Um, the paper starts on page 47 of the pack. Um, I'll take them as read, but th there are two documents attached with the paper. Um, there's a partnership approach to working with people and communities, which aims to set out how we want to work across the whole of the Lanks and South Cumbria Health and Care Partnership. And the second document is the ICB strategy for working with people and communities, which is a requirement for us to have in place as part of the um, readiness to operate for the ICB. Um, so something that needs to be prepared by the 27th of May. Um, section 2.3 um, of the report um, describes that this is some key points really about this is a developing area of work. Um, we have in, kind of undertaken some uh, public engagement around some of this work, but it's by very means the start of a conversation, not not the end of one. And, and as the ICB develops, we expect this area of work to develop as well. Um, it's not a typical communications and engagement plan, which is positive. It's more about how we're going to embed working with people and communities across the organisation from decision making to on the ground. Um, Section 2.4 of the report reiterates that this builds on the best work that we've done um, across our existing organisations, our CCGs, but also with wider partners as well. Um, we heard loud and clear from some of our engagement groups that some of our existing groups and, and local ones want to retain and to be part of some of the work that we're doing. We absolutely need to keep them involved um, and they want to have that clear connection between the work in place and also um, with ICB decision making. 
Section three of the report describes some of that engagement. Um, I think there is quite a lot to do. The, the time we were doing some of this work, we were also um, in a pre-election period. We had some significant pressures in the system. And as I say, this is this is definitely a piece of work as we go forward. Um, but we have worked with some of our existing groups. We've run some surveys with local people. Um, we've been connecting with existing CCG groups, engaged with Health Watch, the voluntary sector, some of our local authority engagement teams, and also been supported by a multi-agency communication and engagement review group, which a number of these um, people on that group are on the call as well, which included GPs, some of our lay members, which was really valuable to this work. In terms of the documents themselves, um, the Health and Care Partnership Approach document starts on page 54 of the pack. Um, that sets out our principles and our approaches for how we want to work together with our partners. It sets out the value of working with the voluntary community and faith sector, which is another area of work we're developing with Health Watch and also local authorities. Um, and and how, it sets out how we want to work with our communities and that work we do together. Um, the ICB strategy for working with people and communities on page 76 um, is a little bit more detailed. It starts to explain a bit more detail about some of the legislation, the legislation for ICBs, but also ICSs, and particularly that duty to involve, which will transfer from the CCGs to the ICB. Um, slide three of the paper also starts to set out um, the audience for the documents, which I think is pretty important. And page 73 to 75 describes some of the outcomes of that public engagement with different groups and, and how that's influenced the document over the past couple of months. Um, and a key one for me was 75% of people were really keen or, or certainly felt that good looks like a um, real link between the public involvement and the feedback we get and the actual decisions that the ICB makes. So I think that's a key um, thing that we'll be looking for, that visibility going forward. Um, we describe um, in page 10 of that, that document the steps around public involvement. It's pretty clear that we need to point out that's not a linear process at different stages and different times or different pieces of work. We touch into that involvement ladder or that ladder of involvement. And I think the key thing about getting this right, we'll be doing the right things at the right time. And again, that's something that we'll be developing, but we've already got some really good examples where that's a working or be will work in the future, hopefully. On pages 15 and 17, we set out um, the different levels of the system we'll work at. I think a key thing again from that engagement is people said we need to involve well and do do different things at, at different levels and at all levels. So I think we describe some of how that will work at different levels of the system there. And in pages 19 to um, 19 to 23, we describe the how. So how are we actually going to take this from words on a on a paper, words in a strategy? to actually living this with real involvement on the ground and throughout throughout the ICB. Uh, so in terms of next steps, we are conducting an equality impact to risk assessment before this is actually endorsed and adopted by the ICB. We'll be producing this in a number of accessible ways, so it's really visible for our in, in a more public facing version and certainly an easy read version as well. There's already a significant amount of work taking place across communications and engagement teams across not just the CCGs, but other organisations as well. So I wanted to give some assurance of that. Um, and, and also we're, we're working with the multi-agency communications and engagement review group to continue to look at that, the, the governance section, which is which is described in the paper as well, um, particularly in terms of establishing um, a public and engagement committee for the ICB, but also working with Health Watch, where we want to develop a, a real community uh, an engagement forum which helps to advise some of the work that we do going forward as well and connect into our places. Uh, there'll also be a requirement for a public involvement policy which is one of the national asks. That's not something the CCGs and Langston's South Cumbria currently have but again a positive thing about building the principles from these documents into that policy which the ICB will expect to be endorsing as well. Um, and I think the request for the committee is certainly to note the development of this document um, prior to submission to the national team on the 27th and prior to it being adopted by the ICB when that's established um, and the work that's been in progress to develop this. I'm happy to answer any questions, David. Thank you. I'd be keen to hear from David Blacklock and from Debbie, please. Debbie, do you want to go first? 
Um, yep, can do. Um, so it's a couple of comments and then a question if that's OK, David. So um, comments is just to say thanks to Neil for the report and um, that I commend the general approach and the two new strategies that have been developed. I think it's fantastic to see how that national guidance and priorities and framework around patient and public involvement are going to be reflected in our own commitments and our ambitions around that area as well. I think Neil's done a brilliant job linking with the um, comms and engagement review group, which I'd chair and is mentioned. And that's meant that there's been really valuable and quite detailed feedback and input from partners like um, lay members on CCG boards, place based partnerships, trusts, local authorities um, and the voluntary and community faith sectors, which I think has added a lot of richness um, and also is really important because it shows that um, we're listening and embedding. Right, Abby. It's challenging to be the next Doctor Who. <laughs> Jeff, let's, let me come to you and I'll come back to Debbie. OK, I mean, th 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 this, this, this is, I can't put it as well as Debbie, but this, this is like looking at a fantastic glossy brochure of that brand new car you want to, to, to sit in and drive, isn't it? It looks really exciting. Uh, but but the, the book question for me is, having looked at the um, reflections on what integrated care partnerships should be and the feedback that we got in this last month or so, one of the comments was about, integrated care partnerships uh, sort of leading on strategy and policy to inform the ICB and, and, and I, so I, taking that into context and thinking about we're not quite the new organisation yet I'm, I'm just wondering uh, does this need to go through another step Neil to, to gain that sort of ownership of the new system does it need to go through the integrated care partnership and and sort of how and, and be worked through in more detail there before before it's sort of endorsed and approved and finalised um, rather than this committee. So it's good to see this at this committee, but I'm just wondering where it goes in the future to, be, to, to gain life and acceptance. Thanks, Jeff. Hold on to that question, Neil. David, please. Uh, thanks, David. Just just a few comments from me, really, as uh, uh, following your invite. So, so I think, uh, Neil, it's an incredibly helpful strategy, and you, you know, I've been hopefully, um, you know, I've seen the strategy and been we've been involved in helping to to shape some of the thinking in there. So, thank you for that opportunity. Um, in terms of what the work that Healthwatch is doing and and will continue to do, I think, you know, we were really clear from the beginning with Neil and Andrew and and others that we need to Healthwatch really needs to move into a space of providing as much support. Uh, and encouragement to 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 great comms and engagement, uh, in particularly engagement as possible. Um, and we we had some kind of reshaping and reorganising to do ourselves to get to get into a good place to do that. So there's four health watch that work in uh, Lancashire. Uh, we've brought ourselves together into a collaborative, which has been working for a little while, but we've needed to strengthen that. And with some investment, as has been described at the committee before, um, from the ICB, we've, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Rimpy Bassa, who's on the call. Uh, today. Rimp is our new strategic lead for Healthwatch Together uh, and she's shadowing me over the next few weeks and months but uh, the, the, the idea of Rimpy's post and similar posts across ICB areas is to really just help us to think about how do we connect Healthwatch more into what's going on uh, with communications and engagement in ICB so hopefully Rim Rimpy will be uh, coming and meeting some of you and trying to help us just get on the pitch with us and try and help us think about how to do this uh, really well. Like I say, there are similar roles across the country um, and uh, so we'll be looking at what everybody else is doing, but I'm slightly competitive and want to do better than everybody else. So um, we'll be taking lots of good ideas, but also building lots of our own um, and we'll be working as, as closely as we can. And, and again, Rimpy will help us with this with Healthwatch England, who are, I guess, leading some uh, you know ideas and creativity around how we do better engagement in local communities. So uh, that, that's all I would say, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, welcome, Rimpy. Is there anything you wish to add? Uh, 
Hi, thanks, David. Um, just to say that I've read some of the papers um, and I'm looking forward to working with you all. I'm excited to be joining at this stage and I acknowledge the scale of the transformation, the challenges that you've overcome and the progress that you've made. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Right, Neil, back to you. Jeff's question in particular about next stages and where we go, please. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff I, I completely agree that there's there's a huge part of some of these documents that's definitely about our, our ambitions. I would say that for the majority of people who, who work in public engagement involvement uh, and some of our decision makers and leaders who, who are absolutely passionate about this area, there is nothing in this document that probably wouldn't, as you say, absolutely be something that absolutely rings all those bells or something that we want to see. Um, I, I would say that the probably the ICB bit is where we've been a little bit more detailed of what are the things that we're going to do that actually make sure we're starting to build on some of the good that we're doing and that that section where we go into 21 different areas, 21 points, and I, I would like it to be smaller, but there's a lot of work to do. Those are the kind of areas where we want to build over the next 12 months. So I imagine we'll come back to how well are we really doing this? How are we really living it from an ICB perspective? From a wider health and care perspective, I think, again, it's about how we bring some of this to life. So just through some of the design and development of this document, we're starting to link really clearly with some of our public involvement teams and our local authorities to actually start to do some team to team work to look at how do we really do some of this work together. I think it's more about how do we start to do it and in integrate some of this work as opposed to some of the words on the page which absolutely align. So I think we're going to start to see more of that work progress. And again, the work that we're doing with supporting the voluntary com community faith sector is, is the same of that. We're also linking this in with how do we work with some of the work across the provider collaborative so how do we start to look at some of this around some of the elective care recovery program and work with patient experience teams within the trust to say actually in that area let's really understand what what's happening with some of our um patients in Lancashire and South Cumbria who, who are on elective care waiting lists and look at how do we how do we use some of this to to really support some of the work we want to do with some of those groups so absolutely I think maybe some of that challenge that you've put in there is one of the ones we want to keep holding to ourselves to look at how we're really doing with some of this. The ambition's great, but we need to really start to turn this into how, how does it start to really live and breathe at the heart of the Integrated Care Board organisation? Thank you, Neil. Well drawn, very positively received. Um, look forward to updates in the future. Thank you very much. Fully endorsed. Right. Uh, operational. It, it, it's a contradiction this operational planning for this year, a year that we're already about seven weeks into. Uh, Sam, are you starting this and then Carl come in? I think Carl's going to take us through it and I'm quite happy to sort of maybe come in at the end on some of the finances if that's OK. Yeah, yeah fine, Carl. OK, thank you. So the, the, this is in your pack and so I won't go through this in, in onerous detail. Um, the first few slides are reiterations of uh, information that you've had before, but just wanted to provide assurance about the way that we've managed the operational planning um, sort of process, working up to the final submission of activity, performance, um, finance, workforce and narrative plans at the, uh, on the 28th of April, as David says, one month into this, uh, th this financial year. So there was a process whereby uh, system leaders um, but, but sort of led the uh, sort of process and we were able to ensure that there was uh, so in particular uh, a good connection into the, the uh, sort of provider collaborative to ensure a sort of consistency um, of approach across our across our providers. Um, the timeline you will have seen in terms of the, the way that we sort of set that out between the uh, publication of the um, sort of planning guidance in, in January through to our sort of submission on the 28th of uh, 28th of April. Just wanted to um, hesitate, uh, hesitate on, on these two slides to say that right at the start of that uh, sort of process, that timeline that you've seen, we felt it was important to ensure that we set uh, a number of frameworks within which the, the plans would be developed. So the first one was the overall planning framework where we mapped the components of the operational plans that we were being asked to put together, which are the, the blocks in blue, against the four key aims of the new organisation, so the Integrated Care Board, um, and then to set out a number of principles within which, uh, within those aims that we would expect to be 
um, sort of adhered to within the development of plans and then set out a consistent approach in red about how we expected the plans to be sort of developed, taking account of each of those uh, each of those aims and those areas. So fairly significant expectation around um, delivery during the first year of operation of the new uh, of the new organization. Um, clearly, uh, it was important that we would uh, meet our sort of financial um, expectations and we set out a number of principles in advance of the development of plans that would hopefully help us to ensure that we met those uh, we met those expectations on us in terms of um, delivering plans within our financial sort of financial envelope. So in terms of the detail of what we submitted then on the 28th of April, there were some key assumptions that we made within those plans. Um, so you'll be aware of the fact that there's, I mean, it's, it, it's dropping off, but the, but there is still a, a significant level of sort of COVID related um, sort of bed use within our hospitals at the moment. Our plans have assumed that that, that level of usage will drop during this first quarter and will fall to um, a level that was in, in line with early summer last year, which is the national expectation, which was, was around 5% of bed sort of bed usage. So that means that within our plans, we, we've assumed that at the end of quarter one, the cost related to additional capacity, which we've opened to deal with that um, sort of COVID related sort of demand would, uh, would be taken out of uh, our plans. Um, clearly, um, COVID has an impact on our staff as well. So we've assumed within our uh, within our workforce plans that staff sickness rates fall by an average of one percent um, by the end of the year to, to reach. Uh, it's interesting. You know, we've got different levels of um, baseline staff sickness rates that are experienced by uh, by our trusts. Um, uh, it's important to say that we've not made as yet any adjustments for the second half of the year of the impact that primary community um, sort of care schemes will have upon the level of um, sort of bed utilization within the within the hospitals indeed as you can see by the final bullet point bed occupancy in our plans averages at around 94 percent across our, across our organization so in order to continue the, to, to meet the urgent emergency care pressures, to, to meet ongoing COVID demand, and to ensure that we deliver on our elective care uh, recovery expectations. What we've had to build into our plans is a continuation of current bed occupancy levels at around about 90, uh, 94%. So um, what we're hoping that, and we'll come on to this a, a little bit later, what we're hoping is that by the end of the year, actually we will start to feel the impact of some of those primary care uh, community care schemes on uh, on our plans. So just to run through a few uh, a few highlights, um, and I would accept a criticism that these focus upon um, acute um, expectations and on elective care expectations in particular, but that has been I think very much the focus of the national uh, and regional uh, scrutiny of our of our plans and the expectations that we've been asked to, to, to achieve. So the first point was around we were expected to achieve at least 104 percent of 2019-20 activity levels, which sort of weighted to take account of um, uh, sort, uh, sort of case mix and such like. Um, that will allow us to anticipate a certain level of income around the elective care recovery fund. So our plans do now um, although there's a little bit of tweaking around um, sort of the, the way that those are calculated uh, nationally, but we, we, our plans do allow us to meet that expectation. I think importantly for our uh, for our populations, we've been able to set out that within our plans, we've made a commitment that there'll be no 104 week waiters by the end of June, that there'll be no 78 week waiters by the end of the financial year, and we're going to make a significant impact on those who have been waiting longer than 52 weeks for their care by the but, but by the end of March. Still a very difficult position, but a significant uh, improvement upon our sort of current position. 
Within our plans, that there was also an expectation that we um, increased um, the uh, RTT um, sort of delivery by uh, by 10 10 percent over and above. Uh, 1920 and we don't quite achieve that we're, we're at 109 percent against that uh, against that target but first of all we don't think that's going to be a, a non-compliance issue but importantly we feel that our plans still allow us to deliver the waiting time expectations although we don't quite uh, achieve that sort of throughput throughput target from our, our workforce plans we are looking to increase staffing establishment by uh, 383. We're looking to increase staff in post and reduce bank and agency by 400, which is a, a lot uh, and it's a significant amount, but it's 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 insufficient really. Our, our, our bank and agency staff utilisation is still sort of fairly high, and one of our uh, one of our areas for improvement, as uh, sort of Kevin was sort of saying it earlier, is is around how we improve further on that on that position. Um, as far as cancer services are concerned, then we, we meet those expectations around sort of 62, um, 62 day waits for, for, for treatment. Um, and we're in, in line with our uh, continued in, uh, investment in mental health services through the mental health investment standard. There is an expectation that mental health staffing will uh, will increase uh, within Lex and South Cumbria sort of Foundation Trust. Um, from a finance point of view, um, so we uh, I'll come on to the detail of that in a moment, but essentially we've submitted a balanced position, but there are, there are some allowable expenses that we've been uh, allowed to take account of within our sort of submitted uh, submitted plans. So let me move on to the next next page and give you that detail. So first of all, as you saw when we, we looked at the timeline earlier, when we had the guidance back in, January um, that there was a, a particular calculation that was set out around calculating uh, inflationary pressures and what's happened since January is of course there's been significant increases in uh, a lot uh, lots of areas in particular in, in, in sort of fuel uh, uh, um, prices so um, our providers uh, and our um, sort of CCGs have um, are planning to incur higher levels of inflationary pressures than were, were reflected in the uh, within the planning guidance. So we've calculated that. We, we've worked out what the detail of that is, and we, we think that that comes to some 51 million pounds across uh, across our uh, CCGs and across our sort of providers. Um, and in in conversations with the regional team and national team, we were allowed to put those into our submitted plans, although we've yet to come to a resolution about how that will be, uh, how those costs will be um, will, will be managed and, and dealt with. Second point was around, um, I reflected earlier that there's currently within our within our trust that there, there are beds that are open purely to take account of the um, sort of COVID related demand and we anticipated that that would drop off after quarter one. There's a cost associated with that of some sort of 28 and a half million pounds and an expectation that those costs would come out after sort of quarter one and that capacity would be you know, would, would be closed and those staff utilized elsewhere. So when you take those two together, there's an 80 million pound um, figure that we were allowed to uh, submit within our financial plans, although it, as I say, it's important to say that those have yet to be yet to be resolved and we're sort of waiting to to hear about how we um, might have to sort of make further changes to our plans in line with whatever uh, outcomes of uh, sort of national and regional negotiations we're, we're sort of currently undertaking but so apart from those particular areas just to reiterate that we submitted a balanced system sort of financial uh, sort of financial plan although it has to be said that um, within those plans that that meant that we were we had to put in a, a five percent um, sort of cost improvement program and there's a significant um, piece of work that needs to be done around understanding how we're going to deliver that and we'll, we'll come on to that in a moment so in terms of ongoing uh, ongoing issues so uh, 
we recognise that there's more work that we need to be done around our workforce, about how we triangulate workforce against finances and our forthcoming um, efficiency drive. So particularly around sort of driving down those bank and agency staff uh, sort of utilisation. Further work around clarifying our out of hospital developments and the impact that those will have on, on, on plans. So those are things like how we deal with the backlog of long term condition reviews in primary care, where we know that from research that sort of Peter sort of led with uh, with with others across sort of primary care that there's um, twice as much uh, uh, probability of being admitted to to hospital for, for when somebody's not had their sort of long term condition review for over sort of for over a year. So we know that we need to deal with those. Uh, with that backlog in primary care and we know that we start to take account of um, investment that's in things like sort of virtual wards and to our sort of community response that so we've not yet taken account of those um, in our plans um, but certainly we're anticipating that those would start to drive down the numbers of patients who don't meet the criteria to reside when they're waiting for a uh, to be discharged home or discharged into it, it, into the care sector so all of that needs firming up and needs to be re sort of reflected sort of reflected in our plans we recognize as well that there's a, a backlog in mental health services our plans it, through utilization of the mental health investment standard allow us to continue to to meet the expectations around the long-term plan but we know that there's a backlog uh, that's creating an upward pressure on demand and, and at the moment we've not we know that we've not tackled those that that backlog within our within our plans and we need to come up with a way of uh, sort of doing that and that five percent cost uh, cost improvement program uh, and the efficiency and the sort of risk mitigation um, sort of record uh, uh, measures need some significant uh, significant focus going forward and that takes us to the to the final slide uh, that uh, and, and all of these um, sort of Kevin um, sort of referred to in in his uh, sort of introduction to the to, to the meeting. So we know that we need to have significant focus on the, the uh, de-risking our financial plans, uh, as the phrase goes, around um, a number of key areas that I think it's fair to say that here that, that they're expressed in fairly acute focused um, ways, but actually they're, they're whole system issues about how we improve flow across the whole of the system in order to allow us to um, sort of move people so sort of quick uh, quickly out into sort of the community setting how we manage demand better in the community setting to to take away that uh, the, the impact on our pressurized uh, sort of hospital uh, uh, beds um how we deal with um covid and infection prevention sort of going forward not just in hospitals but in places like you know the care sector how we deliver on our elective um sort of recovery expectations and how we start to um, sort of build upon um, sort of corporate platform and sort of clinical networks, as uh, sort of Kevin was saying earlier, about how we sort of drive out inefficiencies in our system through through that route. So that was that in terms of the sort of summary um, of our plans. Let me stop sharing and ask if there's any. Well, first of all, Sam, was there anything that you wanted to add, and then ask for any sort of questions that you might have on the plan. I guess just to give some context to this. I think it's really important we understand why we're trying to balance this plan and why we've done, you know, why, why, what we're trying to do here. It's high risk. We know we've got 5%, as, as Carl said, built in. And we know that's after assumptions that after quarter one, we'll be able to take a, a significant amount of cost down because things will, will, will improve around COVID. I think we're going to get some support for the things that are outside the planning guidance that we talked about. But the reason for pushing and making sure that we can do as, as much as we can to balance this plan is because we want to be on the front foot and we want to start developing and getting away from putting templates and plans in and, and move into a more strategic approach for our population. So this is this might feel very much about finance and a big focus on finance at the moment, but we've got to get this right because as in doing so, it gives us massive opportunities. So I think there are significant risks, but there are significant opportunities for us to really turn a corner now with, with, with our planning. I think the national team have been really pleased that we've been able to get to this point. 
um, we've had feedback that we are in a better place with our plans. I think the fact that we met H1 and delivered H2 and, and last year's plan and have put a, a submitted a balanced plan means that we're likely to attract a lot more support going forward from the national and regional colleagues in, in, in our longer term strategic aims, not least of which includes sort of new hospital programme and other things. We want to make sure that we're on the front foot. So it's really important that although we're talking about finance and it is a big agenda item at the moment, we're doing this because we want to get the rest of our quadruple A right and we want to improve uh, our outcomes for our population. So I think it's really important we hang on to that, which means we have to deliver it now. You know, we, we like like David, David said at the start, you know, you know, we're in the year now and the timetables that we've been given around this planning has been part way through the first the, the first, you know, the end of the first month of the first of the year. We've got to do the work now to get the, these these costs out and start and start moving forward. And I think that the, the bit that sort of Kevin talked about at the beginning around having a focus on a few key areas is going to be really important because the opportunity is there. So we need to drive this out, but we need to start building a five year plan of which this is the first year so we can get beyond just looking short term at one year at a time and start moving forward because this is very, very doable. But we need everybody around the table and a real a real focus on, on on the right things. So I suppose that's all I wanted to say, really. But I think this is this is the okay. start of our journey, and and I think it's got the right focus. But there's a lot of work now to deliver it. Okay, thank you, Carl. Thank you, Sam. All noted. All clear. Tees us up nicely for the new hospital bit, please, Jerry. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Um, I'm going to take the paper as read. Uh, it details quite a lot with regard to the process we went through for shortlisting of options, which is covered in the, the minutes of today's uh, meeting. Um, so I just want to quickly just uh, provide a perspective of the forward plan for the new hospital programme or what's happening this, next. It's worth perhaps reflecting that uh, it's almost a year ago to the day that uh, the new hospital programme presented its case to change the Strategic Commissioning Committee and at that time very much the case for change was focused around hospital estates and backlog maintenance. As we look forward to the next three months for the programme it perhaps reflects how we've now positioned the new hospital programme very much within the context of our system and the opportunities that working as a system presents. Um, we are developing the detail behind each of our options now that includes very much looking at the service configuration that would be uh, related to each of our options, working very closely with the provider collaborative now, looking at the future hospital clinical strategy and how that will work together with the new hospital program. We're also working very closely now with the councils, both district councils and Lancashire County Council, looking at options that may present themselves in terms of sites for possible new build options. Again, this is not just about the site for the hospital, but thinking about the wider socioeconomic impact of a new hospital programme and how that can benefit the wider society for Lancashire and South Cumbria. We are also working with the national team very closely now as they start to bring forward some of their thinking around what they call Hospital 1.0 and the new design of future hospitals, looking very much at uh, the future around modern methods of construction and meeting the NHS's future commitments and ambitions around environmental standards. It's going to be a very busy next three months um, as we work towards developing our pre-consultation business case. Uh, and I look forward to be able to bring that back to the committee or its future construct in the near future. Chair, I'm very happy to answer any questions, but I will keep it short and brief today. Thank you. Jerry, are there any urgent questions anyone wishes to raise on Jerry's presentation, please? All very clear. Thank you, Jerry. Well done. Now, um, I'm not sure. I know that Peter Gregory's had to leave the meeting. I'm not sure that we're core to deal with items 11 and 12. So I'll go to, or someone advises me on that, I'll go to item 13, please. The, Quality and performance report is Roger there. I am. Thank you, Chair. 
Uh, I'll take the paper as read uh, and highlight a few points in the performance section, then I'll hand over uh, to Caroline for the quality element. Uh, the reporting period covers an extremely pressured uh, period for the system, and we acknowledge the hard work uh, providers consistently do. Uh, COVID continues to impact on the performance indicators. Uh, the urgent care section introduced the proposed new standards for ANE, uh, which are aimed at measuring patient experience, time to initial assessment measures from time to arrival to the point of meaningful clinical assessment against a benchmark of 15 minutes. Uh, Morecambe Bay performs the strongest with Blackpool being the most challenged. Blackpool's also the most challenged for the meantime in department and for patients spending more than 12 hours in A&E. And in terms of cancer, February's position against constitutional targets remains challenged. Uh, the hospitals are receiving more referrals than pre-COVID and Blackpool and ELHT are challenged nationally on their backlog position. Mutual aid between providers is continuing. In the performance table in 4.3.1, the 0% at LTH for urgent screening is due to relocation of the service and it affects a small number of patients of seven uh, and therefore very sensitive in terms of its performance uh, figure. Diagnostics, the number on the waiting list uh, over six week waiting performance has improved due to the net increase of patients waiting during February. The waiting list increased by 1500 in month uh, mostly non-endoscopy. LTH is the most challenged provider against the standards. After a fall in the endoscopy waiting list in January, February increased back to December's uh, figure. Increases were at uh, Blackpool and East Lancashire. The non-endoscopy waiting list increased by 1400 in February, uh, all, and that was in all providers apart from LTH. With regards to elective care, GP appointments remain above pre-COVID levels and advice and guidance requests increased in March. Elective activity recovery was 90.8% for admitted and just under 100% for first outpatients in February. And a snapshot in April shows a similar position. The CCG waiting list now has 166,535 patients waiting to start treatment, and that's up 1,500 from the previous month. The 18 week standard is now 64.8%, and there's been a reduction of 288 patients waiting over 52 week waits, and that's now 8,332. Uh, we've got a static position on our 104 week waiters reported in February. Nearly 80% of over 52 week waiters are in our four, four acutes in Lancashire and South Cumbria. So that means 20% aren't. And 53% of all our over 52 week waiters are at LTH. And I'll hand over to Caroline at this point, Chair. Thank you. So uh, I will take the paper as read and I'll pull you to the key exceptions given the time constraints. So I'm taking from section seven onwards. So nosocomial, um, at the time of the report, you can see that the number of positive cases, um, positive inpatients and positive outbreaks had increased, uh, but we are now seeing a decrease, uh, which is pleasing. Um, regulated care outbreaks are also reducing now um, and you can see in the report that the key themes and trends have been highlighted and mitigating actions have been taken. Moving down to section eight, which is the IPACHC section, you can see that the position across Lancashire and South Cumbria remains extremely pressured as previously highlighted in, in, um, in other meetings. The exceptions are outlined in the paper along with the mitigations. I don't intend to go through them given the time constraints. In terms of safeguarding, you can see that the challenges in service provision continue along with um, SUDSI service uh, challenges, looked after children assessments, the exploitation agenda, pre-adoption medicals and the looked after children provision. Further information on these challenges can be seen in the section uh, within the paper. For mental health, you can see the continued uh, key areas of risk include IAPT, access, out of area placements, physical health checks, provision for children and young people and children, um, children and young people eating disorders. 
um, and again further information in terms of those risks and the mitigating actions being taken are included in the report. For the section 11 which is the learning disability and autism you can see uh, the continued areas of risk and also the work that is ongoing to reduce this risk. Discharges from inpatient settings remain problematic and admissions uh, are fluctuating still. Section 11.2 provides an overview of the safe and well-being checks that everybody will be aware we were required to undertake. Um, those have been completed and you can see the key concerns that have been uh, pulled from those checks along with the actions taken. Thank you. Thank you. Roger, anything else you need to say? No, thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. A very comprehensive report, uh, as always, and highlights all as the, the, you know, this is the top of the inbox for the new ICB. It's the plans that Carl and uh, Sam introduced, uh, finalised. The work that goes on, there's some very significant challenges in here, both about elective recovery, about the way that the whole system gets uh, back onto a stronger footing after the peaks of the pressures in the pandemic and about uh, how we prepare for our urgent and emergency care system um, for further pressures later in the year, of course. Now, I think that what sits behind this that you get a bit of a flavour for, but not enough that we should acknowledge is how phenomenally hard frontline teams across primary care, across mental health services, across hospital services and community areas are working in order to uh, keep all the doors open and keep access very strongly for our for our patients. People are people we all in touch with people working at the front line who are doing uh, incredible job day by day after two years plus of of great pressure on the service. So although there's a lot of of red line, red uh, ratings in here, the where performance improvement is needed and where we need to raise standards, that's not because people haven't been doing their very best and working at their hardest. We continue to uh, address and meet the demands and needs of our communities across the whole of Lancashire like, and South Cumbria in a very effective way but the the challenges are clear and we will work together to uh, address them and to make further improvements that we need to make thank you carol do you want to say something thank you chair um and i think just building on what you've said about our workforce i think it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge that it is international nurses day today and to formally thank all our nurses but actually all our professionals um, that, that work to provide those services that you've just described there. Thank you. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, anyone wish to raise any points on this before I bring the, bring the meeting to a close? OK, thank you. Now, um, I'm very uncomfortable uh, dealing with items 11 and 12 for the reason that I said before, uh, we'll come back to you outside of the meeting to get the necessary governance and decisions made on the, the medicines management and um, uh, the glucose monitoring device commissioning. Uh, the CCG transition board papers are there for you to note, the quality and performance subcommittee papers also. I've not been notified of any items of any other business. So I'll bring the meeting to a close. If I could thank everybody, thank uh, members of the public and stakeholders for their interest in our business and for respecting the way the meeting works. Thank you for the members who've contributed uh, and who've attended.